a lot of them still in the in the basket out there on the table so feel free to jump up and get one if you need one we're going to be using this book called better things um, it's a study of the book of hebrews so uh, feel free to grab one if you need it before the bell goes. So hopefully the audio quality is good. Can everybody hear me okay? So Matt and I are going to both kind of take part in teaching tonight, and uh, they're making some adjustments as we go, so hopefully, hopefully it works well. If not, just wave at me if you're having trouble hearing, and I'll, I'll do my best to make an adjustment. But we're so excited to have the opportunity to study together, study the book of, of Hebrews together, and I just want to welcome everyone to our study, both all, all of you here in the auditorium, anyone who may be joining us via live stream uh, maybe visitors, people that we don't even know who, who may be engaging in our study tonight. And if so, so thankful that you're a part of, uh, of our study. Uh, so, as I said, we're going to be studying the book of, of Hebrews. Um, this book uh, we chose um, in part because David Dan, who put this book together, just does a really great job of using questions that take us right through the text, which is really what we want to do. So I would encourage you, grab a book read it, have the questions answered before you come to class. We're going to spend a lot of time answering those questions and letting those kind of guide us through the text this, uh, this quarter and, and next. So um, be here as, in person as much as possible. Uh, that's going to really help the class. If you're here in person, you can participate. And even if you're not comfortable raising your hand, you'll have opportunities to participate at whatever level you, you're comfortable. And you're going to be, be an encouragement to everyone else who's participating in this class just by being here with us. So if you're a member of this congregation uh, and you're watching online just out of convenience, make it your plan to be here the rest of, the, of our study. We'd very much encourage you to do that. Uh, we are going to allow people who sometimes I know people are a little reluctant to raise their hand during class. If you're one of those people, or maybe you're not, that doesn't really matter. Uh, if you would like an opportunity to have a little bit of a heads up that you might be called upon to answer a question, there's a sign-up sheet in the back right next to where the workbooks are. Put your name on that list, and uh, Matt or I will reach out to you a few days before the Wednesday night class, and we'll just say, hey, would you mind answering question one this coming Wednesday? And we'll just call on you to answer that question. That's not to put a damper on, on anyone raising their hand and making a comment or question. I want you to keep doing that as normal, but I but, uh, just want to give everyone the opportunity to maybe put a little thought into the question that they might be called upon to answer. So you will get a heads up if you put your name on that list. I'm not going to just call on anyone without, uh, without warning to answer a question. There's also a schedule in the foyer. Uh, if you want to kind of know where we're going to be from week to week, uh, we're going to try really hard to stick to that schedule because we're going to go through this entire letter, 13 chapters in 24 sessions. And so we're going to try really hard to stick to the schedule. There's a few copies of the schedule in the foyer if you want a hard copy. If you want to just take a picture with your cell phone, that would be great too. Whatever's most convenient for you. I can email it to you, just whatever you'd like. So uh, any questions just about the content, the workbook, the schedule, just anything that I didn't cover? All right, so we're going to go through a couple of things tonight that I hope are very helpful to you as we set the table for the rest of our uh, of our course of study tonight. The first one, I think it's wise for us to think about what are the goals? Why are we doing this? Why is this study important to us? And as I thought about what those goals might be, I realized as reading through the text that the writer really gives them to us. There's no better words that I could choose in stating goals for our study than what the writer of Hebrews gave to us. For example, and, and I hope this is big enough, if not, let me know. Chapter 2, verse 1. Give heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Isn't that a great goal for us? We need to pay attention to what God's Word says. And we need to recognize that if we're not paying attention, giving heed to it, we could drift away from it. It's one of our goals for our study of the book of Hebrews is to give heed, lest we drift away. Another one is in chapter 3 and verse 1 where it says, Consider the apostle and high priest of our confession. Who is that apostle and high priest? It's Jesus. We're going to be spending a lot of time talking about Jesus because the Hebrew writer focuses so much attention on Jesus and his preeminence, his superiority. Well, that was important for these Hebrew Christians to hear, and it's important for us 
to take seriously and to think about and consider. So we're going to spend a lot of time on that this, this um, semester. We're also going to be studying and, and thinking about uh, the fact, as, as the writer states in chapter 4 and verse 1, there's a reason for us to fear. He says, let us fear coming short of the promised rest, that rest that God has promised. We need to have a healthy fear of, of drifting away from that and falling short and not entering into that rest. And by the same token, chapter 4, verse 11 says, let us be diligent to enter that rest. So one of our goals is to exercise not only just that, that healthy fear and think through that, but also to, to demonstrate diligence in, in uh, pursuing that rest. Chapter 6 and verse 1. Chapter 6 and verse 1 says, go on to, your, your version may say perfection, as mine does, or yours may say maturity. One of the goals of our study is to pursue maturity, to develop spiritually. And then another one that I've already uh, accidentally put up there is chapter 6, verse 12. Imit- imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. If there's any book of the Bible that gives us many examples of people that we should imitate, it's the book of Hebrews. Think about the children of Israel and those who, like Joshua and Caleb, entered into the rest. They are a great example for us to imitate. Think about Hebrews chapter 11 and all the people that are mentioned in, in chapter 11. Those are great examples for us today. So we're going to pursue that. We're going to strive to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. In chapter 10, in verses 20 through 24, we see some some more let us statements, and there's a number of them I didn't list. Uh, We're going to notice uh, a lot of applications, things we can directly apply to our lives. For example, let us draw near with full assurance. Let us hold fast. Let us consider one another. Those are great goals for us in this study. To draw near to God, to hold fast to what he has told us, the gospel, and to consider one another as we engage in this study and as we go about our daily lives as Christians and recognize the influence we have on each other. A little bit later on in chapter 12 and verse 1, the writer says, Let us lay aside every weight and run with endurance. Hopefully this study will equip us to do that, to lay aside those things that hinder us and to run with endurance that race that is set before us. And then the last of them that I've listed, and there's many more that you probably could come up with just by reading the text and thinking through this. Chapter 12, verse 25, do not refuse him who speaks. Anytime we study God's word, if we refuse what we hear, we're endangering ourselves. We need to take that seriously, and we're going to take that seriously in our study of the, of the book of Hebrews. Not to lay aside what God has said, but to take heed to it, to apply it in our lives. So I encourage you to participate in this class fully. Ask me questions, ask Matt questions as we go through the study. If something doesn't make sense, take us aside after, after class. We want to make sure we're holding true to what God's word says, and we'd be glad to uh, discuss anything that's on your mind about our study. Uh, So there are also a few goals for tonight. What are we going to talk about tonight? What do we hope to accomplish tonight? Number one, uh, certainly we want to introduce ourselves to the book of Hebrews, think about the context, think about uh, who the recipients are, who the author is, what the theme of the letter is. So we're going to go through that study together tonight. Uh, As I just said, we'll consider the overall theme of this letter, and we'll also give some attention to some applications that we should be making to our lives. Uh, We're going to have a little bit different approach, and I am just thrilled about this. This is going to be a really great opportunity, already has been a great opportunity for me uh, to engage in a study. I've never done this where we've had two teachers teaching uh, at the same time, but Matt has agreed to do that, and Matt and I have already gotten together. We've we've talked through our approach and what seems to make the most sense, so it's going to be a great opportunity for us. I hope that that it's helpful to you and, and that you kind of gain some perspective by hearing two different teachers teach in this, in this, in this book. Um, as we go through the study, we're going to start, Matt and I decided, we're going to start our studies each week, uh, and we could change this somewhat halfway through, but at this point, I think we're going to start each study with actually a short review of an Old Testament passage. Why do you think that would be so as we're studying the book of Hebrews? Filled with the Old Testament. It's filled with the Old Testament. Every page. I mean, there's so much Old Testament content. That's all. If, if all we wanted to do is just look at the Old Testament passages that are referred to or quoted in the book of Hebrews, we could spend our entire study doing that 
every week. We won't do that. But we do want to kind of set, uh, set a, a background and, and, and reflect on something from the Old Testament that we're going to be studying in the book of Hebrews anyway, that's referenced in the book of Hebrews. So that's how we're going to start each study, first five or ten minutes, and then we're going to go right into the, into the workbook. As I mentioned already, the workbook will really kind of guide us through the study of the book of Hebrews. So come, come prepared for that. Um, See what I overlook. Um, well, uh, this last point, uh, we'll, we'll continue the study uh, through quarters one and two. So the elders have seen fit to provide us some extra time. There's a lot of material here, and I'm so thankful that we can have two quarters to go through this book. If you really are getting into the study and you want some other materials, uh, just see me. Uh, David Dan wrote this particular workbook. You may remember the overview of the Bible series that we studied here some years ago. There's a really great lesson. I think it's in part, uh, it's, it's in part five of that series that focuses on Hebrews that gives a lot of just uh, overview type material of the book. Uh, Mark Copeland has good outlines online um, and there's a variety of other things you could reference. If you find those, those things helpful. Am I still okay audio wise? Okay. So also, uh, I'd, I would be remiss if I didn't say thank you to Jane Ellen. She has shared some notes with me that I'm finding very helpful in our study. And uh, if you have some notes and some things that you think would contribute to the study, feel free to share them with Matt and I. We, we would really enjoy uh, being able to consider things that you've put together in your own studies independently. So tonight, we're going to start as we plan to start every session. Um, Matt and I are going to kind of alternate this, but Matt is going to walk us through an Old Testament passage and then actually another New Testament passage that has to do with the theme of Hebrews. So, Matt. Good evening. Um, this is my first time teaching an adult Bible class. Um, so, got a few butterflies, a few nerves, um, but I want to thank Kyle for his patience with me as he's walked me through and set me up for success um, as we go through the study. Thank you to the elders. Thank you, Stephen, for asking me to do this class. Um, for the last 20 years, I've been moving around the country, serving the Army, um, and you never really settle into a congregation. And um, it's been easy for me to um, be faithful, attend, study, but not engage in the teaching and so um, I've truly enjoyed this last quarter of teaching the fourth and fifth graders um, and so when this opportunity presented itself I uh, I, re I won't say reluctantly I nervously agreed um, to do this so thank you to the elders and I just ask for your, your patience as, as we uh, go through this study it, it'll be interesting for sure I've never seen a class taught like this uh, a dual uh, tandem class Hebrews is super interesting as it's written, um, so let's just kind of get into it, um, because what we're going to look at it is Numbers chapter 12, um, verses 1 through 9, um, and it's better things concerning salvation, and uh, I think we, what we can gain a lot of knowledge from is looking at how the Hebrews would have looked at the folks, their ancestors, the stories that they would know about. And so this right here is talking about um, <clears throat> Moses, his interaction with Miriam and Arian, and how God speaks to them. And so we'll just take a, a minute here to read it. Um, start uh, no, Numbers chapter 12, verses 1 through 9. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses and because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, Ethiopian woman. And they said, Hath the Lord spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. And now the, now the man Moses was very meek, and above all, all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and Aaron and to Miriam, Come out ye three unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle, and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. And he said, hear, hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision, and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all my house. 
With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches, and, with, and the similitude of the Lord shall, be, shall he behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. This passage right here is super interesting because it shows us that God spoke directly to Moses. Faith, his similitude, his, his image, um, and, and it's recorded all through the stories that we learn in Bible class as a youth growing up, um, how God spoke. God didn't speak directly to the, to, to the, the Hebrews of the New Testament, right? Um, they, they were spoken to through prophets, um, who received their, their, um, their messages through, through dreams and visions. And so it's very interesting that he, he calls out um, um, Miriam and Aaron for, for speaking against Moses. He calls Moses a very meek or a humble man. And, and it angers God that they're, they're speaking against him. Um, and, and so it's just super interesting that, that God speaks directly to Moses. As it, and he doesn't do that with um, very often, and so just find that interesting. Um, and then I also want to look at. Um, I guess I should advance the slides. I'll get better at that. I promise. All right. So let's look at Hebrews um, verse chapter one, verses one and two. God, who, who at sundry times in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the world. So, as I said before, God didn't speak directly to them, but he spoke to them through Jesus. And Jesus' words, and they, these um, folks receiving this letter would have understood that. They would have been able to say, because the first chapter of Hebrews talks about how much greater Jesus is than the angels. And then further on down in the Hebrews, it talks about how much greater, um, superior Jesus is to Moses. Um, uh, <clears throat> it also talks about how greater than the angels, greater than Moses. The old law um, is inferior to the new law. Um, how much greater Jesus is than the high priest. Um, and then the new covenant is greater than the old covenant. And so as we go through these passages, we'll kind of explore some of that. Um, and then turn over a page in Hebrews chapter 2, um, verse 2 and 3. <clears throat> For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. <clears throat> These two passages, I think, set up the entire theme of, of the book of Hebrews, um, that, that they needed to hear the words that Jesus spoke to them, that if they fail to do that, then they're thrown away their opportunity. They're thrown away their salvation. And as we look through... Um, these passages, it's important to understand that it's not easy. They, they've lived their whole lives, you know, listening to the prophecies of a foretelling of the Messiah. Now the Messiah is here, and now they've, they've believed, they've seen him, they've seen the signs, they've seen the wonders, they've seen the miracles that have been performed by Jesus, by the apostles, and they've believed and they, they've found their, their faith and they're Christians, and at a time when it's not easy um, because of the persecution. And so as they move um, forward, you know, they have to persevere. And towards the end of the, the, the book, it talks about perseverance and how they um, have to, to diligently heed his words. Um, and so uh, uh, those two, two passages definitely set the tone for the book. Um, the Hebrews are reminded of the authority of Jesus. And, and it, they confirm that the new law which they must adhere to. Um, and so, based on that, um, 
I want to ask the audience, so why is Jesus the ultimate spokesperson? Um, and I'll open it up. Why is Jesus our ultimate spokesperson? You know, you were talking about how special it was that God would speak to Moses face to face. And Moses was a man. Uh, and here we have Jesus, who is God in the flesh, Absolutely. speaking directly to his creation, to men and women. Uh, that's why he's the ultimate spokesman. It's, it's, you can't get any closer to God than he is God. Uh, and he's speaking. Absolutely. And um, uh, the, the whole first chapter talks about how he is superior to the angels. And in just my mind, you know, just imagining angels in general, right? And then just imagining that he's superior to them in every way is just hard to, to, to imagine um, his greatness. And so turn with me, if you will, to, to Colossians chapter 1. I think this, this, uh, this passage definitely describes um, why Jesus is the ultimate um, spokesperson. Um, chap- chapter 1, verse 15 through 18. For who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. <clears throat> There's several passages throughout the New Testament, throughout the Old Testament, um, that they go through um, the preeminence of Jesus. I'll just point a couple of them out. Um, Psalms 102, 25. Of old house thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was God. And John 1, 1. He's called the Word of Life. Um, and then you have Matthew three seventeen, a low voice from heaven saying, "This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased." And so, He came um, and, and um, lived on this earth as a man, but at the same time, He was God. He He um, was there at the beginning. Um, he was He was preeminent. He was the first, right? He was before everything else. Um, and and the the image of the invisible uh, of invisible God, um, the firstborn of every creature, um, all things were created by Him. <clears throat> and the Hebrews writer does concur that that God made the world through Jesus. There in Hebrews one verse two, which we already covered, uh, and Jesus has been appointed heir of all things, and. To me, it, it, looking at it through, try to look at it through the eyes of the, the Hebrews, um, that they they would have been hearing all these prophecies and, and throughout their whole life, and they would have um, understood what the fulfillment of all those prophecies meant, and that Jesus has been appointed heir of all the, all things, and uh, and so God's message concerning the salvation of man has been delivered through Jesus, the preeminent heir of all things. Uh, we should give heed to, to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. And that's what I wanted to emphasize, um, is that last point that, that Kyle mentioned earlier, that um, we need to give heed to these texts and understanding of the, the greatness of Jesus, the, the preeminence uh, of um, he came, he lived, and why he, he was the perfect sacrifice to fulfill the old law um and, and establish the new law and with that i'll turn it back over to kyle and i probably went long i apologize well, matt thank you so much for taking us through that and if you want to have some fun when you get home tonight go back to numbers chapter 12 and 
make a mark in your Bible to note every way that's documented in Numbers chapter 12 that God communicated with man. God spoke directly to Moses. He spoke directly to Aaron and to Miriam in Numbers chapter 12. But he also spoke through those three to the children of Israel. And when God was speaking to Aaron and Miriam, he said, I speak, I have spoken through prophets in visions and dreams and dark sayings. And then we get to Hebrews, and, and the Hebrew writer says, if the word spoken by angels, proof said, God spoke through angels. Just think about that. And then we turn to Hebrews chapter 1, and we're about to see this even more as we get into our studies tonight. We see clearly that God spoke all those ways in times past, and it was very effective, and God, God spoke to man. But the ultimate spokesman for God, as Matt just pointed out, is Jesus Christ. So as we think about that, as we go into our study tonight, I want you to turn to page 3 in your workbook, and let's look at some of these questions that kind of kind of laying that down first. Think about Jesus as that preeminent spokesman. Let's think about some things that we know about the recipients of the, of the letter, about the author of the letter, and about the theme of this letter um, as well as the time frame as we go through these next few questions. So let's start with the recipients, and we'll, we'll, guide, we'll let the questions guide our discussion. Question one, what may, what may be known of the Hebrew Christians to whom this letter is addressed based on the content of the book? Um, I'll first give you an opportunity to answer that question, and depending on the answers, we'll, we may read these verses, but anybody would like to give us an answer to the question? Tanya, go ahead. Not just their work in the church, but their lives as Christians. As Christians. Absolutely. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, and that is exactly what Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 says. For by this time you ought to be teachers, right? But they're not teachers. They're instead still dealing with the milk of the word. But as we think about that, and we think also about what uh, is written over in chapter 10, verses 32 and 33, where he says, But recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings. When you think about those former days or by this time, what does that tell us about how long these, these Hebrews had probably been Christians? Probably for a while. They're not new converts. They should have developed some maturity by now, and they had already been through some sufferings in days gone by, and that seems like that would have been some time past. So we'll be thinking about that more as we think about the 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 time frame in which this letter was written here in a few minutes but first let's just think about the fact that here we're dealing with people who've been christians for some time these are hebrews right these are people who grew up knowing the law of moses understanding the old covenant and so we're going to see throughout this book that these hebrew christians they had known the old covenant they were coming to a, a, they, they had come to Christ and they were, should be maturing in Christ. Um, we also notice from chapter 13, um, this isn't one of the verses highlighted in the question, but it is something of note. I think it may be noted in the workbook text uh, that in, in chapter 13 and verse 19, he says, but I especially urge you to do this that I may be restored to you the sooner. And dropping down to verse 23, uh, yeah, verse 23, know that our brother Timothy has been set free, with whom I shall see you if he comes shortly. What do those verses tell us about the location of these Hebrew Christians? They are localized, right? We're not just talking about a general epistle to Hebrew Christians everywhere. The writer is writing to Christians, Hebrew Christians, in a particular area. We don't know exactly where that is, but we know he said, he wanted to come to them, right? So that's, that's another attribute that we might consider about the recipients. Uh, another thing that we sh should possibly note, and, and Tanya really pointed this out, um, is that, that because of that lack of maturity, we see some indications they were losing confidence in Christ. They were thinking about returning to some of these old ways of the old covenant. That's an important aspect as we enter into this study to understand about those to whom this letter was written. Losing confidence, losing their maturity. Uh, but they had suffered for Christ. They had suffered and, and endured persecution for him. And they also had shown compassion on the writer of this letter. 
while he was enduring suffering in prison at one time. So many indications and much discussion over the years about who the writer is, many indications, perhaps it's the Apostle Paul, but uh, certainly we don't know that for sure. So let's talk a little bit about the author and what we do know, what we can know for sure from what the scripture tells us. Uh, and that's really what the next question, question number two in your workbook says, what may be known of the writer of the book based on these passages? Would anyone like to uh, give, us, give us your thoughts on that? Tanya, again, go ahead. So some of these scriptures indicate that he, he was familiar with Timothy, he was familiar with um, the people in Italy, so there was an association with these people. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Stephen. Hebrews 2, 3 through 4, it might indicate that uh, he was not, the writer was not one of the original 12. Yeah. Because he speaks about what was confirmed to us by those who heard him, meaning Jesus. Yeah. So I think that's an indicator, at least some evidence towards being Paul or something that, that yeah. wasn't one of the original 12. Yeah, agreed. And for the benefit of those who might not have heard what Tanya and Stephen said, I'll just recap briefly. Uh, chapter 2, it seems that the writer of this letter was not one of the original 12 apostles. He refers to those who heard the Lord and those who confirmed what Jesus had said. So maybe it was Paul, some have speculated, maybe Barnabas or someone. doesn't really matter, uh, but he was not one of the original 12, it would seem. And then we go over to chapter 13. As Tanya pointed out, he was well known to the readers of this letter. They were not unfamiliar with the author of this letter. Uh, and also the author was associated with Timothy and with those from Italy. Now, does that mean he was in Italy when he wrote? Or does that mean that he was somewhere else and there were brethren from Italy with him? Who knows? I don't know. But we do know that he was associated with brethren in Italy. Paul was certainly one who had spent time in Italy, right? In prison, in Rome. So uh, many indications that perhaps it was the Apostle Paul and some have certainly assumed that. I think the King James Version uh, attributes the book of Hebrews to Paul uh, in, the, in, the, in the title that it assigns to the book. But regardless of that, these are some things that we can know for certain from what, uh, from what the scriptures tell us. There's also one other thing that we can know about the author. Uh, Brother Ginton, go ahead, and then I'll, I'll add in what I wanted to say. Might be. Inspired, I think the, the writer is inspired. It's part of the canon of scripture. That's right. Uh, and that gives the authenticity to what the author is saying here, whoever it might be, that this is what God says. That's right. He's an inspired writer, and what he says is completely in harmony with what else we read throughout scripture. And that really complements what I was thinking of as well, which is that when we think about the author of the book of Hebrews, we recognize on every page, this was someone who's very familiar with the scripture. He quotes it over and over and over again. He is, he's very effective in drawing from the Old Testament scriptures the points that apply to these Hebrew Christians, things they need to be thinking about. So well-versed in the Old Testament, uh, an inspired writer uh, of God who, who uh, delivered God's message to man. So let's think for a few minutes then I'm sorry I didn't uh, go through those points uh, on the slides. Hopefully these are the things uh, that you've already kind of taken note of. Uh, but if not, read those passages. Think about those things as you think about who wrote this letter. Let's think about the time frame for a moment. I'm looking at the clock. We've got about 15 minutes, so we're going to hustle through some of these slides, but we're going to do our best to cover uh, as best we can. How does the evidence within Hebrews suggest a definite time frame for the writing of the letter? What are some things you noticed as you consider that question? You? All right. Okay, sacrifice is still being made at the temple. Stu? Yeah, gifts are offered. Levitical priesthoods is, is still intact. That's right. Anything else? Tanya and then Kevin? That's right. They're getting ready to vanish away. It's clearly after, after the Lord's resurrection, essentially, because he's now seated on the right hand of God. So. Yeah. After Jesus has ascended. That's right. Stephen, did I see your hand? Do you have anything else? Very good. Matthew? The author is, or if the, if the recipients are familiar with Timothy, 
and it's probably sometime after Paul's secondary, second missionary yeah. journey. That's right. Really great observation that uh, if they're familiar with Timothy, probably after his, his second missionary journey. So as we think through those points, those are all excellent points. Things to think about. The old law is still being observed in, in, in the sense that there's still a priesthood, there's still those offering sacrifices at the temple. Those things are addressed in the present tense at this time. So what's the time frame for the writing of this letter? And I guess I should again be clicking through. I apologize, I keep forgetting that. What's the time frame for the letter? Well, it's obviously before the temple's destroyed. But if these brethren had been Christians for some number of years, it would seem it's not too early. And if it's after the second missionary journey, that even hones it in a little bit more. Most scholars that I've read will pinpoint somewhere between 64 and 69 AD, just before uh, the destruction of Jerusalem, just a few years before that. So uh, any comments or thoughts on that topic? All right, so let's move forward then. Let's talk about... Let's talk about the theme, which is probably of the things we've talked about so far, so far the thing that's most applicable to us, right? Uh, it's interesting to know who the recipients are, and I think it's important to have some context about who's receiving the letter and who wrote the letter and the time frame which, in which it was written. But the theme really directs our thoughts towards the lessons that we should be learning as we read this letter, right? So we're going to note, and we already have read chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, in chapter 2 and verse 3. And Stephen, I, I meant to ask you, are you the one who shared with me the theme by text of Scripture? Somebody in this congregation shared with me a document that was produced. I don't know who produced it. It was quite some time ago, but uh, I took that, and, and I would encourage you to do, do the same thing. It's helped me a lot. I took that, and uh, it's basically a document that outlines a text that summarizes the theme of each book, just right from the, the, the verses within that book. And in the book of Hebrews, I wrote near the heading of my book the word theme, and then I wrote 1, verses 1 and 2, and chapter 2, verses, uh, verse 3. Think about that. What's the theme of the, of the book? The theme is really all about the preeminence of Christ as God's spokesman and holding fast to him, not drifting away. And that's what we see in chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, chapter 2, verse 3. So as we think about that theme, that it's all about uh, holding fast, being partakers in, hearing the word of God. And there's a number of other words, perseverance, different things we're going to see brought out in this book. Now think about how that applies to us as we study, go through this study. We need to hear. We need to hold fast. We need to persevere. There will be difficult times. There were certainly difficult times for these readers. They were urged to persevere through times. Uh, so question four in the workbook, why were the Hebrews in need of encouragement? And there's several passages listed next to the question. Um, give me a, a thought or two on that question. So they wouldn't have an unbelieving heart. Okay, that's right. That, that they would not have an unbelieving heart. Tanya, what were you going to say? right that's right i just studied recently with a friend who is of the opinion that once somebody accepts christ into their heart then whether they obey or not is inconsequential to their salvation that's not the message of the book of hebrews the book of hebrews warns of danger in departing from christ that there is no other sacrifice for sins if they depart from christ they've rejected the one who died for them and so there is a danger of, of, of drifting away anything else Matthew? In chapter 12, we see they're undergoing hardship. Yeah. So that endurance, they are undergoing hardship. They need to endure. Brother Ginton? Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Hebrews 12 and verse 2. This That's right. Ties it all together. Very good. J.D.? Well, it may have already been touched upon, but the fact that earlier we said that they seemed pretty uh, young in terms of their maturity as Christians. So I would think that they would need encouragement because of their still relatively infant state in terms of their walk with God. That yeah. they need to see that little push to keep moving forward so they can advance to the next level, so to speak. And, and that push, as you're referring to, is something that we constantly need, this reminder 
we need to develop. And so as we think through the text that were listed beside the question, think about the danger of, of departing from God. Think about the d- danger of becoming dull of hearing. Think about the danger associated with becoming sluggish. Those are some of the words we see used in the scripture that direct our minds toward what it is we need to be careful about and why it's important for us to examine this. Ben, did you have another thought? Yeah, I may not go too much in it in the book, but I was just kind of thinking about you know, the thing about reverting back to Judaism, that temptation, you know, seeing the animal sacrifices, the family members who are still, you know, observing the law of Moses, I think that would have a big impact upon them as well. And then maybe even their view of, well, we've been trying to live for God. We've suffered for him. We've helped other people and this is kind of where we are right now so mm-hmm. even that kind of discouragement yeah it is easier to go back to what we knew yeah. it was from god yeah. our family and our friends and our neighbors are all participating in it yeah. you know so i think that element is in uh, is important as well and kind of think about the sluggishness that could happen yeah. and the difficulties that could come yeah yeah yeah, there's times when I, th- when I think of sluggish, I think about sometimes the way you feel when you get out of bed in the morning and you're just trying to get rid of that feeling. It's, it's that feeling. It's that thing that motivates us. And so we have, to, we have to set that aside and replace it with something else. And God is urging us to do that, to replace. He's urging these Christians, these Jewish Christians, to replace this sluggishness with a passion for the things of Christ and a recognition of his preeminence. Let's consider a few other questions. We've got five minutes. We're going to go through as many of these as we can, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll tie a bow on our study with regard to the introduction and move right in to chapter one uh, next week. So question number five in the book said, why is there a sense of urgency in the instructions the writer gives to these Hebrew Christians? What, what would you say to that? Why is it such an urgent thing? I think about a slippery slope. Okay. Path each day or each moment or whatever, I think it's just going to get a little bit easier. So yeah. the writer knows, it seems like he has good knowledge of these Christians. So sensing that, you have to move with a sense of urgency. So even with the brethren today, when they start, when they start showing these signs of becoming sluggish, you know, action has to be taken fast. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a serious matter, isn't it? There was, there was this danger uh, there were things that they needed to avoid and they needed to be warned of. They needed to, to address these things with urgency. Stephen? You know, you're talking about uh, they were called babes, you know, in Christ, really, but their lack of maturity uh, in, in, in Hebrews 5. Just think about the, the danger that a baby's in if no one's there to protect it. Well, yeah. they're, they're kind of exposing themselves yeah. to danger by not maturing. So it is urgent. They yeah. The evil ones are done to just take them out. That's right. Uh, it's breathing, and their soul was in jeopardy. Yeah, this, right. is not a, this is not just well, it's not going to go as well for you. No, you're in danger of being. Yeah. Jeopardy. Really great points. It is a serious matter. They needed to develop maturity. Uh, Hebrews chapter ten, uh, the the writer warns that he who is coming will come and will not tarry. When we think about the fact that judgment is coming, that 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 we don't know when that judgment is, it's it's an urgent matter that we make sure we're ready, we're prepared. Hugh, did you have a thought? Sway, yeah. and the immature can be easily swayed. Yeah, and as has been said, they're drifting away from the Lord, and that's uh, so condemning. That's right. That's right. Hey, let's look at uh, question six for a moment. Why does Hebrews emphasize that Jesus is superior to Moses? Why is that a subject of this letter? Kind of addressed it to some degree already. If you go back to the law of Moses, you're going back to something inferior. And they were tempted to do that, right? I mean, that's the, that's the point. There was this temptation, this allurement to return. So emphasizing that Jesus was superior to Moses is really an appeal for them to recognize Jesus as the apostle, the messenger, the high priest. He is the one, the only one through whom salvation comes. If they lose sight of that, they've lost, they've lost everything. Jesus built, uh, Jesus built the house. He's not the house. As a matter of fact, Moses is, is, is equated to the servant in the house. Jesus is the son within the house. Jesus is superior in every way. And he points out that while Moses was faithful as a servant, that, uh, the son, that Jesus is the son over his own house, 
and that Christians who hold fast to the end will make up that house. And so that's an important as- attribute of that as well. Um, I'd love to get lots of comments on, on all of these questions. We just don't have time. We've got just a couple of minutes left. Um, I think what I'd like to do is instead of going through questions eight, uh, seven, eight, and nine, let's just go right to question 10. Actually, let's look at question nine real quick, and then we'll look at question 10. How does the writer describe the condition of Christians who choose to sin willfully instead of remaining faithful? What's their condition? They're lost, right? Kevin, were you going to say something? Yeah, there's nothing left for them. There's no, there's no sacrifice left that they reject Christ. There's nothing left. That's right. There's some passages that are somewhat challenging, I think, for Christians in the book of Hebrews related to salvation. Uh, if you're just taking some notes of some passages to study, I would encourage you to jot down Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3, and then Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 through 31, which is referenced in the question, and compare those passages. Okay, we'll spend some time with that as well. But, but compare those passages and think about the importance of remaining faithful and the danger of, of drifting away uh, and, and the condition of those who sin, sin willfully and drift away in that regard. So question 10. Um, how does the message of Hebrews apply to Christians today? Yeah, this, this idea of preeminence of Christ cannot be overstated. That's right. Uh, you know, we see whole religions that, that, that recognize Jesus as a prophet or a man, but it's Christians that recognize Jesus as God yeah. in the flesh. It's, it's a huge differentiator, and it also prevents us from going down paths of false doctrine. If he has a preeminence, we're going to follow him and him alone. That's right. Yeah, very good. J.D.? I suppose another way that it could apply to Christians today, this was, like, it was discussed, like, how uh, falling away from Christ was a slippery slope of being led away. <coughs> I may be paraphrasing a bit, but uh, it could apply to Christians today of, like, those whose faith may seem like at the end of their rope helps them to tie that knot to hang on, mm-hmm. for lack of a better term, you know? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, this whole idea of maturing, uh, I hope that we don't lose sight as we go through this study of how important it is for us to be maturing as Christians. So easy for us just to get trapped in probably the same trap these Hebrew Christians were. We're just going through our daily lives. We're busy with so many things. If we're not focused on feeding on God's word and developing spiritual maturity, there's something wrong. And it's a serious matter we need to address. And we need to, we need to be thinking about how we progress, how we become more faithful, more devoted to Christ, how much we should appreciate him as the apostle and high priest of our confession. So we're going to spend some time on that next week. I'd encourage you to please, please read chapter 1 all the way through chapter 2, verse 4. We'll attempt to cover really all of that next week, uh, as you'll notice on the schedule, and then answer answer the questions on page 5 of your workbook. So thanks so much for being here tonight. Really enjoyed the study.